Hi, I'm Rob and welcome to the Uncut Network. Every month we rotate between directors, actors and super specific genres. We cover everything from exploitation to things your parents will absolutely approve of, relative unknowns to household names and everything in between. The Uncut Network is the movie podcast of all the niches and to cover those things and more, I am joined by Kat. Hello there. Hey Rob. Graham. Hi there. And first time on the podcast, Petros. Good to have you. Hello there. How dangerously erotic. <laughs> that's, that's my MO. That's my MO. <laughs> you learn this about me quickly. I am dangerous. Is it dangerously erotic, you said? Dangerously uh, that's, erotic. That's, yeah. that's, what I'm, that's what I'm going with. <laughs> it's completely undermined. I was going to say, how are you all? And in dangerously erotic. I think that'd be a first. Honestly, yes, my favourite '90s Michael Douglas movie. There, yeah, that's a, that's a super niche genre, isn't it? Dangerously yes. erotic, something that's like too erotic for you almost. <laughs> oh God! That weird phase in '90s cinema where like A-list actors were in like erotic thrillers, that were, like soft porn at the same time. It was such a weird time in the '90s. <laughs> So weird. But yeah, um, I, I'm fine, certainly. I'm enjoying the, the brief window of actual warm weather we've had today. That's been nice for August. The day, the day of summer we've had. The single day that we've been allotted, yes. Uh, Petras, catch yourselves. I am busy, busy prepping for Fright Fest, so this is a nice uh, reprieve from a night of more horror films. So yes, I'm looking forward to the palate cleanse that tonight will hopefully be. I'm on a similar vein. I've just mainlined every single Michael Bay film. (laughs) (laughs) So, So it was a nice reprieve to come from guns, explosions, gratuitous shots of female actors and uh, all the grossness that comes with that. Some of it I love. Uh, I won't say which ones. Uh, and, uh, so, to, yeah, to be in the kind of pastel-coloured world of uh, our subject today was uh, a delight. Mm. That's a, as good a segue as I'm getting. So uh, I'll pounce on it. The director in question is part of the most complicated family dynasty in Hollywood. Uh, so complicated that one of our guests is but one of the podcasts dedicated to that menagerie of, of family dynamics. And that is uh, Sophia Coppola. Yes. Um, don't ask me to explain the family tree. Uh, the obvious one is Francis Ford is her dad. Nicholas yeah. Cage is her cousin. I think and so. Then it right, gets so do, you, do you need this? Do you need this? So within two of these films we'll be discussing today, you have Jason Schwartzman, who is her cousin, Robert Schwartzman, also her cousin, uh, Jonathan Schwartzman, the DOP of The Rock, uh, Armageddon and such films, uh, is also her cousin. Uh, yeah, there's there's Weird and Wonderful Tendrils. Spike Jones, obviously married to Sophia Coppola for a period. Uh, who else is there? Talia Shire is her auntie, uh, Adrian, from the Rocky franchise. It's kind of a weird and wonderful collective family uh, that goes on and on. And I'm sure we'll get to talk about uh, Sophia Coppola's husband as well with these two films. Yes. Um, usually I'd ask where you heard of directors, but that seems like a dead end. So I think a more interesting point of conversation, I, I don't know how many there is, but we'll see when we talk about it. But uh, what are your feelings on uh, second generation filmmakers, like people who like, take after a parent? I know there's at least two, so I may be like pushing this into a very, very short corridor. Are we, but, uh, are we um, going to invoke the dreaded phrase Nepo baby at some Nepo point? Nepo baby, you? yeah, if you want to yeah. go nuts on Nepo babies. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, at the moment, I'm in a stage where I prefer. The- Nepo baby directors to actors who've like been on a few film sets and think, yeah, I can do that. Uh, so in the in the extremely limited field of opportunities that are open to new directors, you can either do it because you've acted in a film or do it because your dad made a film. And yeah, I'll go with the dad made a film ones. I saw my first Brandon Cronenberg film recently, liked that perfectly well. So yeah. yeah, not the only of the Cronenberg broods to actually want to do that. Uh, his sister is a one oh, in the oven. Yeah. I don't know when that's making light of day, and obviously it's horrible and disturbing from the synopsis. <laughs> <laughs> you know, keep it in the family that way. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, I mean, I think other than Sophia, Brandon Cronenberg is the only one that's sort of jumping jumping to my mind. I mean, he is literally continuing the family business, not just in terms of directing, but in terms of the films that he's making as well. And it, like you say, it seems very much that the sister is also going in in that vein. I just, I'd love to be a fly in the wall for their family dinners because <laughs> they must be, just imagine the conversations that they must have if this is the art that they're creating. Or the food. Imagine the food. For some reason, it's all broke. You know what I mean? It's, all like, it's like an open body, even though that's not the food. It's, it's, it's roast beef inside of an open chest or something like that. <laughs> yeah. At, every, at the start of every dinner, Daddy Cronenberg opens up his shirt and just gives birth to the meal out of his yeah. chest. <laughs> I wasn't going to. Yeah. I, was, I, I thought that of all the families that would have somebody on the table as as the table and you just eat food off them. I'd say the Cronenberg would probably be top of that list. The Cronenberg room. One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. The 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 the, the brood would be saying. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think Ridley Scott kid has also done a few bits. Oh is that Jake Scott? Yes. Yeah, so. you're right. Yeah. And Jennifer Lynch had a a rocky start to her film career with Boxing Helena, which was <laughs> I think one of the more baffling of those 90s erotic thrillers we were talking about earlier but she still works she still gets stuff done what happened to her because she was talked about a lot and then just nothing every now and then she puts out usually a new horror movie and it generally gets pretty good reviews they haven't really broke through yet but she was one of the directors on um monster the uh jeffrey dharma series on netflix oh, really? as well. yeah, yeah, yeah i didn't know that that was the one that caused the uh, all sorts of fuss, wasn't it? The mm. controversy behind that one. Yes, yeah. Hmm. But yeah, I, I admire her still plugging away at it because I do, like, I, I have read some of the reviews from the time when Boxing Helena was released, and it's really hard for me to imagine a film's reviews being worse than that. <laughs> well, in the last recording, we're tying with putting Nico Mastroakis on the list, so there's, there's <laughs> down, there's certainly down. <laughs> I, the director of Isle of Death and pretty much the worst movie that you will likely ever see just across the board in everything he does and touches. He's a one-man Greek film industry. You know, it's not George's land from us. But he's such a character. <laughs> he is indeed. Um, so on to, um, unless there's anything else, anybody add? Eh, we're all good. Well, this is a subject that comes up on my podcast a lot is the whole Nepo baby thing. And like the, my kind of view on it is especially in the form of Sofia Coppola, when you look at her like history, like the way she was brought up, like there's footage of her on the set of Apocalypse Now. She's literally a baby in The Godfather. She is the baby at the christening at the end of that film. I always like use the comparison, like if your family were bakers and you grew up in a bakery, th there's surely got to be a chance that you'll go, you'll get to an age and go, yeah, I'm just going to continue the family business. And I, I just think, like, I sometimes think, like, when it comes to directing and stuff like that, like the film industry, it's it's looked at as, like, a dirty thing. And, like, it's, it, if that's all you know, then surely you're going to, do you know what I mean? Like, we, we look at, I don't know, cut, uh, like, yeah, Jacobs and Sons, like, uh, locksmiths and go, oh, a nice family run business. But we see it like the Coppola family, like Sophia Coppola's got a film and everyone's like, ugh, ugh, she's got that because of who her dad is. And like, <laughs> <laughs> I think with all of it, it's like if they prove themselves, if they kind of get it and they're shit, it's like, well, that's. Uh, it becomes right. self correcting, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. And then, and then if, the, if, if they knock one out of the park, do you know what I mean? If on their second film, they're oscar nominated and like win the oscar for best original screenplay then surely that's got to be like testament that oh no they've actually yeah they might have got there because they've got their parents to open some doors for them but i don't know i'm sure anyone given the opportunities do you know what I mean like uh yeah. everyone's a nepo baby for something that's what that's what i live by <laughs> whether it's my mum got me a uh uh a, my work experience at pizza and end up working there for four years so I'm a nephew baby for Pizza Heart, baby. What can I say? <laughs> there are bad examples as well. I mean, Jack Jackie Chan really screwed up with his kids. So it's not all, not all good. People saw their clairvoyance in the wiped out elms, the harsh sunlight, and the continuing decline of our auto industry. Even then, as teenagers, we tried to put the pieces together. We still can't. 
Now, whenever we run into each other at business lunches or cocktail parties, we find ourselves in the corner going over the evidence one more time. All to understand those five girls. But after all these years, we can't get out of our minds. Cecilia, the youngest, was 13. And Lux was 14. Bonnie was 15. Mary was 16. And Therese was 17. No one could understand how Mrs. Lisbon and Mr. Lisbon, our math teacher, had produced such beautiful creatures. And to the director of the uh, Sofia Coppola and the two movies that we'll be doing, uh, 1999's The Virgin Suicides and 2006 Marie Antoinette. Um, so going chronologically, we'll start with 1999's The, the Virgin Suicides. Who wants to take a stab at the synopsis for this horrible, sad movie? <laughs> <laughs> Not to colour my, you know, opinion of it too well. Yes, of course. No, it's it's adapted. I'll, I'll take I'll take a go at it. It's adapted from uh, Jeffrey Eugenides' uh, acclaimed novel. It's a coming of age story, uh, and and also a not coming of age story set in the nineteen seventies in a deliberately kind of any town suburb about a family of sisters of very pretty blonde sisters born to the Lisbons, a couple of uh, school teachers living in the neighbourhood. The local boys are obsessed with them. And then one of them attempts suicide. And that seems to be the trigger for everything, both in the Lisbon family household and in the neighbourhood at large, to just become dysfunctional, to be seized with this strange kind of despair that in, in in many ways, Rob, uh, I'm sorry to get into the themes on a synopsis, but it's a very vibey movie. Um, yeah, yeah. In many ways, parallels coming of age and, and the loss of innocence. So the second movie we're talking about. Tonight, <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, Carter, what, what are your feelings on The Virgin Suicide? So this was actually a first time watch for me. I've seen a lot of... Sophia's other work but this one passed me by which is odd because I was a teenager in 1999 it was one of those ones that was always in the teen mags and stuff because it's got Kristen Dunst and Josh Hartnett in but just never made it to to see it so it was a lot darker than the other sort of teen fodder that was around back then and I was quite I think the only thing I ever really knew about it was the soundtrack because that air song was on like the box showing my age, <laughs> the box constantly. Um, so yeah, it, it definitely took me by surprise. Hmm. Yeah. The soundtrack is a masterpiece. I just want to get a word in for that there. <laughs> I absolutely adore that soundtrack. I can't remember it, honestly. It's all been sort of over, overplaced, uh, written over by the, the other soundtrack that we're going to be talking about later. Fair, yeah, but I, I think the the Yeah soundtrack is worth pulling out and listening to as an album because it's them straight after they did Moon Safari, so it's you know prime period air. Mm. Uh, but also you have this other strain in it where, as well as this very beautiful, haunting, ambient soundtrack, you've also got a, a soundtrack of 70s songs from the era, some of which are wonderful some of which are terrible, but all of which are used so perfectly for the kind of... Do you, you know what I mean when I say pre-cool? You know, when you're mm. of that age before you really give a shit about what's hip or not? It's a very pre-cool version of the 70s, I think. Yeah, it's not the, it's not the kind of top 40 hits kind of... Do you know what I mean? Like, it's... Yeah. It's doing that. It's doing that James Gunn thing before James Gunn of going like, "This is what people actually probably listen to around if they're yeah. from the seventies." Not like oh, or that, and it's probably these ones are probably a bit cheaper as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think I I really appreciated it. It's sort of seeing the other side of it. You know, you realise how awful teenage boys really, really are. We when we we were just the worst. I mean, yeah. the things that these boys do to these poor girls in this movie, they're just the worst, honestly. 
It's interesting you say that because I, I remember watching this shortly after it came out and I really loved it and I wondered if it would hold up because I had read, like so, some people I know and some people I've read on Letterboxd have said, oh, it's, it's just a film about women's suffering told from this completely male lens and like quoting that line about how the important thing was that we loved them and saying, oh no, well, that wasn't the important thing. The important thing was that they were in despair and that they died. And you think, yeah, but you remember this is adapted from a novel and novels can have unreliable narrators. I think the roots of the Lisbon sisters' unhappiness are perfectly clear in the film. And the fact that you see it through this, like not humorous, but ironic lens, this lens of people who don't get it and don't see what they're doing does not lessen the power of that at all, in my opinion. Wow, you really turned my joke and made it into something serious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think to that point of the like the narration, the whole film feels like somebody just telling you like little stories from their childhood. Mm. And it is like and it's and there's certain moments that kind of pierce through the veil of that like Obviously, we never get to see. We we don't know which one of the boys is telling us this story, like because we've got Giovanni mm. Ribisi kind of narrating the film. But then we get that one, like the couple of moments where we see Trip Fontaine, like almost being interviewed, and then it's you kind of I don't yeah, as I said, like the the veils pierce, and you're like, there's there is a darkness. Do you know what I mean? You can look back at things with rose tinted spectacles, like this boy is, but then. I imagine a lot of those other people, if they were probably interviewed, would probably be like, "No, there was there was something in the air around that time." Do you know what I mean? It was it was it wasn't this kind of I don't know pristine place to live, and mm. the Lisbon sisters probably did what happened to them affected other people in other ways. We're just hearing somebody who probably do you know what I mean? Parents gave their daughter a debutante ball and like ended up on the right side of the tracks, whereas other people like we see with Trip Fontaine, like it's clearly like in some type of rehab facility or something like that and it's like i don't know shows that like thing of that horrible thing and i guess uh teen movies don't tend to go into to it is it's like when the credits end on that that night after high school it's like yeah. and that was the best years of those people's lives everything after this was fucking horrible <laughs> <laughs> It's got that great scene, hasn't it, where they get one of the girls' diaries and they're skipping through it and the kid who's stole it says something like, oh, how many poems about dead trees can you write? They just skip through it for the bits that mention them. And I think that's as close as you can get to a thesis statement. You know, we are watching the sisters' lives with all of the bits that tell us why they did what they did skipped over by these boys but i think it's still still very clear to me i felt that way anyway hmm. um cat you've not said a lot i mean i say it was a it was a first time watch for me so i'm still sort of like piece, piecing together things and i you know i wasn't a teenage boy so i can't sort of talk from from that angle but i think it does capture the essence of being a teenage girl however however briefly especially the sort of girls that they are they are these very beautiful young women and everybody in the town sort of sees them for their beauty and like the the like the older women sort of are jealous of them and yeah it's very i think it does a good job at highlighting that it's it is tough being a teenager in general, but in, in these girls, it, it shows that all they're doing is being pretty and that's still too much for, for some people. Hmm. Interesting period details as well, I think. Um, very well observed for somebody who at that point probably wouldn't have experienced much of what she was depicting. Like little, yeah, that's a good like... point. She probably <laughs> didn't have much of an ordinary suburban teenage childhood, really, no, did she? Yeah. No. It's it just little things like it always like, amuse me when it's talking about sort of past generation. This would make a great double bill with a, a movie I watched a few years back. I can't remember who directed it now, called Over the Edge. Oh, right. Which uh, about sort of um, a new suburban town and the kids don't really have anything to do, so they all turn to drugs and violence and... Uh, sort of rebelliousness and then it gets worse when they take away the one place that they've got sort of the uh the community center 
this both sort of take very suburban looks at the seventies. But in this one, what's really interesting about it is it kind of seems like it's this time before teenagers existed. There's like a really interesting party there yeah. where the dad's there, James Woods, which remember when he was actually interesting and not horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Remember back in the days when people would allow James Woods onto a set with teenage girls? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's showing like the boys his, 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 I don't know why it's like a Mesha Smith display. Yeah. Uh, they're all wearing suits. One of the teenage boys with his greased back hair, who is hilariously just bad, starts hitting on the mum. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's just it's really, really awkward, but funny. And it feels very personal, that whole scene. Like, it comes from experience. Uh, yeah, I think one of the things that... it's I, did, I have read Jeffrey Eugenides' novel, but it was many, many years ago, so I cannot remember, like, how faithful this is to it. But some of the bad teenage boy chat-up lines in this feel very much like something Sophia Coppola might have observed firsthand. They're realistically squirmy, I think. Yeah, and I imagine even even in the kind of the 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 valley of the Napa Valley where she kind of grew up, she probably did experience these. Like, I think it's universal being an awkward oh, teenager, yeah. no matter yeah. no matter your kind of financial status. Like, there, there's something like lived about that, and um, I guess like the period detail. She's she, she's basically got a dad and his mates to be like, this is what the seventies were like. Do you know what I mean, we were there. Like, yeah, <laughs> got Fred Ruse like helping us out. Like. We're okay, and I, th- I, I think like to to touch on like the themes, and I think like what's really interesting, and you can probably spread this across Sophia Coppola's career is like th- this film, and I think it is interesting the way that the lens is taken. I know I'm going back to a previous point, but is it's it's about fame, and I think like that's what kind of makes her the right person to tell this story. Like it's about a te- like teenagers who are thrust into fame by other people. And yeah. like, we'll, we'll probably talk about that as well when we come on to Marie Antoinette is is obviously like you just look at her own life as a teenager like 18 years old was thrust into fame by her father on the set of the Godfather 3 because Winona Ryder dropped out like literally weeks before filming so it's like she kind of knows what it's like I think to yeah be like looked at do you know what I mean like in the way that these girls are and I I, f- I feel like it's all intentional to be like yeah it's, it's about them but it's it's about other people's perception of them because I imagine that's like well coming off the back of Godfather 3 I imagine she probably read a lot of stuff that was about people's perception of her as opposed to who she actually was so like I think I think that's a really important part about this film and kind of like a foundation block for her whole career like you look at lost in translation it's like it's about fame it's about like somebody who is adjacent to fame like that's kind of a very thinly veiled film about her relationship with spike jones like <laughs> like you think of a music video director and she's the kind of put upon mm-hmm. like spouse in that, in that relationship and trying to find connection with people Marie Antoinette, fame. Uh, <laughs> somewhere, fame, being the child of somebody famous and trying to get, get in uh, in the world. Yeah. The bling ring, fame. Do you know what I mean? What it is to, like, want to be famous and this kind of perverse thing that we all have of, like, we want to be a part of this glitzy, glamorous lifestyle and what people would do to get there. Uh, the Beguiled? I'm not so sure. Like... Well, it's, about, it's about being desired, I think you could say, yes. with the beguiled. But it's it's interesting, this, to me, that she is, to go back to that sort of Nepal baby, Chad, she is the quote-unquote Nepal baby who is most likely to tackle privilege directly and to say, you know, that this is my mindset, this is how I was raised, I can do no more. And yet, when you look at her films stylistically, she's not, resting on the family name in that sense because this and none of her films in fact look anything like her dad's films no but i think one of the things she had like inherited from her dad or maybe learned or uh it's just innate within their family is one adapting like material like kind of knack for adapting material and one kind of like creating a film that is like what what would be like kind of like an elevated version of a genre like francis ford coppola made the outsiders and rumblefish which were kind of like slightly elevated like 
coming of age teen films. And it's Sophia is essentially doing that again here, but going, the boys have had this for, for years. Do you know what I mean? She's like, let's, let's, let's give one that is like for a very feminist lens. I know it's like, it's got the group of boys in there, but it's, it's made by a woman and like, should hope from what I've seen from a lot of like people I follow on Letterbox is like it speaks it speaks to yeah it speaks to it speaks to women as well. Do you know what I mean? It's like even if it is kind of through this prism of the the boys in the town, I imagine a lot of women have that experience of I don't know being spoken about by do you know what I mean and kind of second hand like I don't like I'm 32, so I, I would remember the days of msn chat being the thing and yes. back on the playground I imagine a lot of girls would have got chatter of like oh so and so was saying this about you and stuff like that and almost feeling like you are an observer through your own life through the prism of what the boys are saying about you and i'm i'm, I'm not sure if you, you i don't know you can speak to that cat in the, in the fact of like I imagine, yeah, I, 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 I can only imagine that, like, sometimes, I don't know, that, that, is, that is the experience yeah, I mean, of young girls. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was fortunate enough to sort of get through my teens before MSN really became became a thing, but there was still, there, it was still the, the rumours in the playground and things, mm. and it was always, like, the super popular girls were the ones that had stuff sort of spread around about them, and because I remember there was this one girl and she was just seen as like perfection at our school. Um, she was dating a much older guy. He was definitely in his 20s and she was definitely not 16. But she was spoken about as like the queen of, of our high school. She was like super pretty. She was super clever. She was really good at sports. And yes, yeah, she was like our own mini celebrity. So I guess she would have been like our version our version of this family and it yeah it's fascinating how obsessed people become with teenage girls like even even grown-ups you look at like the era of Lindsay Lohan and Paris Hilton and stuff you know they were it wasn't just the tweens who were obsessed with them it was the grown women and the grown men as well they were all mm. over Heat magazine it's yeah it's so weird how we latch on to to young women over over young men and even now uh in sports uh i can't remember if i'm pronouncing her name right but uh emma radicanu oh yeah won, yeah uh, won tennis open i don't understand tennis it's all the same thing <laughs> uh, she won and then when she came back she had paparazzi waiting outside of her house which on on in the face of it it seems fine but when you peel it back that sort of sports person there it's grown men with cameras waiting outside the house of a teenage girl Yes. Well, it's it's it's, it's, it's these creepy. things where you have newspapers doing like countdowns to like Maisie Williams oh, turning yes. eighteen and stuff yeah. like that. Like like this kind of this put like Millie Bobby Brown this kind of like fascination like the, the the amount of kind of female celebrities we've seen that have had to like leave social media just because like these weird parasocial relationships and I think like this, this film's ahead of its time because it kind of it really does tackle that idea of like the parasocial relationship. Like you get that yeah. perfect sequence in this film of the boys envisioning them going on like these excursions around the world yeah, with yeah. this like group of girls who they really, as you've mentioned earlier, they know nothing about really. They've skimmed through all the kind of the meaningful stuff to the stuff that relates to them. And like, they've just developed, there they are. The, the, the lens we see them through is, is, is that lens. But I think it's very, intentional and i think like for that fact it does it does it does hold up because it's not like i don't know i think if if this film had been handled by a man like which i think originally it was going to until sophia coppola was like i've heard someone else got the right for that that book i'm going to literally write a script and like force force my hand and probably say to her dad like can you have a fucking word here because i ain't having <laughs> <laughs> There's a lovely phrase that Jeffrey Eugenides, who wrote the source novel, said, which is something like every writer must be a mental hermaphrodite. Yeah, every writer okay. must be able to see the point of view of men and women equally. And I, I think that's there in this. I think the fact that it's 
boys speaking does not lessen the fact that what kicks you in the gut is the tragedy of the Lisbon sisters and you absolutely understand the repressive conditions they're kept under. You understand that as being, you know, uh, an example of how young women are, are treated generally. The prurience, as, uh, as you've said, yes, but also the repression you know, the exploitation of their beauty and also the fear of what it'll do if they get out into the community. Because it, it started to remind me a bit as it went on of a film I hadn't seen when I first saw it, but it reminded me of Samira Makmulbaf's The Apple, which is one of my absolute favourite films about two girls in Iran who were, like, held essentially prisoners in their own home for the first 12 or 13 years of their life. And what happened when they got out. And for all that's set in Iran, and we certainly have a, a certain stereotype of how women are treated in Iran, but one of the eerie things about the Virgin Suicides is that you see this very pretty, idealised American suburbia becoming exactly the same kind of prison. I mean, I think for all it is about the young cast, I think uh, Kathleen Turner and James Woods are very good as the Lisbon parents in this, and you understand that the odd way they have of being sort of neglectful and overprotective at the same time. They control every aspect of their kids' lives, and they also seem to be barely cognizant of massive things that are happening yeah. to them. They're male malevolently evil, aren't they? In the mm. fact, like we never, we never like. We never see them like harm the girls in any way, like physically or anything like that. But we just kind of see, like, I guess it's a very modern term. We see these kind of microaggressions and kind mm. of like just this way of life that they've they've instilled, like, in their daughters of just like, yeah, it's repression, repression, repression. And even even like, yeah, James Wood's character Ronald, like, we you question like his implicit is it do you know what I mean like is it i don't know is it the what like it, it, it begs loads of questions right you're like where is where has this come from like it's not like it was that initial suicide attempt that caused yeah. it or like it's like i guess there's a fundamental christian element to it as well mm, that was the yeah. point, like mm. so yeah it's it's an interesting there's a, a few interesting bits that we haven't mentioned that i just would like to bring up just from the perspective that it takes using the male gaze and using it as a means to show how desperately sad these girls are. The first one is when, um, I can't remember the name of the characters, but uh, Josh Hartnett finally gets to say so, that he can take one of the girls on uh, the prom. And yeah. he's trading, like, uh, how, do we, how do you word it? Uh, the other sisters are going, and he's trading, taking them, like, some sort of, yes. like, have some sort of monetary value, and it's just really creepy. And the other bit is when it, it's clear that the girls are having such a hard time and the only way they can sort of help is by phoning them and playing records. It's That's such a great scene. I, I think it's, it's all a matter of tone, right? Is yeah. the thing like, we would see a scene like Trip Fontaine going, hey, I got a chance to take the Lisbon sisters to the dance in like a teen, an out and out teen comedy. And like people would probably think nothing of it. Do you know what I mean? They probably like now would look back and go, oh, "It's a bit icky." And like, mm. thinking, but I think it's I think it's all a matter of tone and the fact that the film has like, yeah, is willing to go to those dark places. And I like that the the fact that the film does kind of flirt with the idea of like almost becoming like an out and out teen comedy. Do you know what I mean? Like the kind of the whole premise of like we're going to the big dance and stuff like that, which would be like the denouement of most films. Whereas in this, it's kind of like just like a passing moment, like we're, we're, think we're within it. I think it flirts with being a horror movie as well. I think <laughs> there are some bits towards the end that are genuinely chilling, not just yeah. to do with the titular suicides, but that the bizarre party that happens after the Lisbon sisters have died where there's just this really oh, yeah. horrible atmosphere of death over the whole thing and <laughs> everyone's trying to make a joke about it and ironize it is it's an incredible there's, scene there's one bit where somebody jumps in the pool and says uh, i'm a teenager isn't life so hard it's like yes. being very glib about the fact that what was it six teenage girls just killed themselves yeah yeah in the party the theme was asphyxiation as well which like yes. we learn is like how Lux took her life, like in the yeah. car, noxious gases, and it's like 
and it, yeah, I think I think it's kind of uh, deft of Sofia Coppola that she kind of within this film that is about fame in some ways is also is also does speak to class and weirdly of of all films that this reminded me of in a weird way is Edward Scissorhands in the way that it kind of like portrays this idyllic kind of suburban like like but it's all a bit weird and like we kind of like in the same way in like Edward Scissorhands we get all of the all of the gossipy neighbors do you know what I mean like they're, they're like oh I heard she I heard she she she's really unhappy in that house and like we like we hear everyone gossiping all the time and like like both films as well darkly comical like this film like as much as it kind of is quite dark and goes to some grim places and the subject matter there's some fun there's some real funny stuff in there like the kind of yeah. story about that like uh exchange student who throws himself off the roof and stuff like that that's kind of like that yeah that's like coming of age teen comedy fodder like it's kind of like and like, like uh, the teen i can't remember it was called andy i think the guy who was with the the first party he says, oh, we do heads or tails. And every time he picks heads, I think he's developmentally disabled as well. And they're, to the credit of that movie, yes. they do not make a joke about it. And I thought, wow, it's the yeah, 90s. Yeah, that is quite <laughs> a rare thing for 90s Hollywood films, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But they didn't. It was absolutely fine. But um, I think we've covered it quite extensively there. But before we wrap up, is there anything that we haven't mentioned uh, like the, throughout there, uh, Kat? Anything that you like the claws this section out on? No, I mean, I just have to applaud the, the story and the film for actually tackling teen suicide. It's not something that is featured. I mean, the only teen film that I can off the top of my head think it would be Heathers, but in Heathers, they're not technically suicides, they're murders covered up in, in that way. And I think teenage years are a very tumultuous time. They're, you know, the statistics grow year on year, especially in a social media obsessed society so i think it is good that there is this film out there it, however it's dressed up that does address those issues and does open people's eyes to as perfect as these girls may appear there was obviously something something broken for them hmm. there is a film that as you were saying that it did remind me of too um from a few years back we played netflix quite recently uh, spontaneous yes which if you haven't seen that, I would check it out. It's it equates school shootings to spontaneous combustions, but sort of fame wise, it, it plays very, very close to the Virgin Suicide. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's grim, but it's, it, it's funny with it. But I guess so is the Virgin Suicide. So again, yeah. another nice double bill. Whenever the little masses are presented with a new addition to the family, we place a blank playing card into the box. Our initiate then has the privilege of drawing the card, and Mr. LaBelle will tell us which game to play. I got chess. I got old maid. Seriously, what the fuck is old maid? Fitch. So I just take out the card? My dear, it is your turn. <laughs> what does it say, girl? Oh, it, says, it says hide and seek. Are we really going to play that? Everything okay? Right, so now we're at the part of the show where we pick who was coming up in a future episode. And for a future episode of Actors on Court, which again, I'll take some getting used to, um, Samara Weaving. Hmm. Samara oh. Weaving, uh, niece of Hugo, I think. And also uh, a fun fact about Hugo, well, yeah. oh, it's coincidental anyway, but I'm going to throw out me, me Hugo Weaving fact, but he's the greatest Nigerian actor in the world. There we go, I've done it. He was <laughs> born in Nigeria, he wasn't born in Australia. So, uh, well, Samara Weaving. Samara Weaving's a great choice. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Niece of Hugo, a twin of Margot Robbie. Um, <laughs> twin of Margot Robbie. 
<laughs> and she's yeah. quietly assembled a really good filmography too, I think. I mean, she'll always have a place in my heart for Ready or Not. Ready or Not is a superb film, but I will leave that to the podcast that actually covers her. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it would help give her her sort of stature, really, didn't it? But oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it done made dirty. her a horror icon. But you know what? I'll tell you what, I'd seen her before that. So I think she has a very funny supporting part in um, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri as well. She's in that. She's yeah. In that. She makes for a great slasher villain than The Babysitter, which I think is a properly fun film <laughs> that people talk too much shit about. <laughs> I will say, she's, I don't like the uh, Little Scream. She deserves better than that, Samara Weaver. She she did deserve better than that because the best scene in the film, uh, Scream Six, is a very very bold opening scene, uh, oh, yeah. and I was thinking this is superb. I mean, it kills off Samara Weaving instantly, but I'm thinking this is wonderful stuff. Anything could happen, and then the rest of Scream Six, not really much, not really much different. It's just the previous one again uh but, but there's some cool stuff in it <laughs> but i'm just like that opening scene though it promised so much <laughs> it's got tony revelory doing a great job as a nasty little incel it's yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah samara waven's great and she's coming up in a future episode of actors and cut so look forward to that people of france are hungry sending troops to america is costing more than what we estimated but we can't let england win we must show our strength. We will continue aid to the Americans. And when they went to the Queen to tell her her subject had no bread, do you know what she said? Let them eat cake. That's such nonsense. I would never say that. Uh, and here, you're having an audio with quite a big group. <laughs> I think I'm here sucking your toes. Don't they ever get tired of these ridiculous stories? Oh, and they say you gave Thomas Jefferson a special tour of your gardens. <laughs> it's Jefferson admiring the royal bush. <laughs> That's awful. Can't you do something? I'm not going to acknowledge it. The French can be fickle, and uh, Her Majesty would do well to be more attentive. Life is getting harder for the people of France. The bread shortage is grave. Well, there must be something the king can do to ease their sufferings. Tell the court jeweler to stop sending diamonds. You don't need any diamonds, do you? No. How pretty Madame Royale is. I'm pretty you find yourself. <laughs> Say thank you. <laughs> she is certainly a daughter of France. <laughs> oh, I know. And then that leads us to the second movie of the night, um, which is 2006 Marie Antoinette. Uh, I don't think you can really do a synopsis of this because it's a biopic and it's about a historical figure. But nonetheless, does anybody want to take a stab at what this movie is about? I'll have a go. So, uh, yeah, Marie Antoinette is, as we said, a, a biopic, a loose biopic about the, the life of the famous... Uh, Austrian turned French queen and uh, the film focuses heavily on her arrival in France and her relationship with the, the future king of France and there's a lot of cake, a lot of macarons, a lot of partying. It's a very different biopic to, to others on the market. Absolutely. I think the first note there I had was no historical accuracy besides well, it's like the basic historical it's facts it's funny this because it is based on an ex a huge and extremely well researched biography by the great historian lady antonia fraser and a lot of historians have said that there's a lot of very accurate detail in it there's also a, a lot of very inaccurate detail in it and it wants you to notice that yeah like yeah. she was mad keen on the strokes for example <laughs> I think the anachronistic soundtrack though is just like Sophia Coppola's got a itch she wants to scratch and it's like, Do you know what? I've grew up like my brother's been directing videos for the strokes and I'm kind of like I imagine by this point it's dating a member of Phoenix who's like, Yeah, I'm gonna like I I, I wanna put in all this stuff. And I think again, it speaks to the it, it would come straight back to themes and like it's it's showing that thing of 
Marie Antoinette would have been in her time, but fame doesn't hasn't really changed since then. Do you know what I mean? Like the, the soundtrack can be from the nineteen eighties and we're talking about the, the mid two thousands, but being thrust into fame and being famous is is still the same. And I think I think that's a thematic choice, right? The kind of an anachronistic soundtrack to it. And it it, 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 it I think for me it drives that home. It just makes it relatable as well. If it was yeah. his period authentic, the music would be very ornate classical music. And but it, does, you... it does that near the end, and it yeah. feels like like it does that to signify a, uh, a tonal shift. Yeah. Absolutely. Because when yeah. we get to that, when we get to the kind of like ornate orchestral music, is when like shit is going south. And like, like it's when people start like... speaking French as well around that time. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it's, well, it, that, it just puts you that... in the mind space, doesn't it? It's like teenagers partying. Mm. They'd be listening to like rock bands and pop bands. They won't be listening to classical music, at least in the era later was made. So it helps us get into the headspace of these people, really, rather than just and this the... historical figure to keep at arm's length. It makes it a bit more re- relatable. And the other thing about that sort of creep of classical music into the soundtrack is that it happens at the point when history... You know, the actual history that we remember Marie Antoinette for is making its appearance. It's when you start hearing people say, you know, there's dreadful poverty in the cities, people are angry. We don't see the execution, but we know exactly where this is going. And I think, you know, before it's it's saying that when you're young and rich, history doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what era you're brought up in. That experience is always the same. But as you get older, the forces of history, the age you're living in, the decisions that are made by people in power start to assert themselves. Yes. Yeah, the soundtrack is is so important in this film because as well as it bringing in the more classical stuff towards the end, at the the beginning, as she's learning her way, it's kind of more indie, chilled out music. And then at the points where she starts to to rebel when the the brother-in-law and sister-in-law have produced the first heir. She then starts to have all these wild, lavish parties. And that's when suddenly we get much more Bow, poppy, wow, wow. aggressive. Like you get, you get candy, you get Susie and the Banshee's Hong Kong garden. Uh, and again, it then quietens down when she moves to the country and then starts to spin back up again when there's the um, affair with, with the soldier, you know, you get Adam Ant's, uh, get Adamant, uh, Kings of the Wild Frontier. Kings of the Wild Frontier, yeah. Yeah. And um, so, just the the music itself, you can listen to that soundtrack and sort of you know feel those waves of of teen rebellion threaded just through their positions in in the film as well. Mm. Um, and I think the consistent theme between the two movies is they are both desperately sad, really, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's not agree. a happy movie. This is a movie about. To relate it to sort of modern age, it's sort of a trust fund kid. Hmm. Well, I I think the the kind of the, the flog the horse that I've been flogging is like her whole career is like it's like you like as kind of privileged as a position it is, and it's kind of like and I imagine she'd come under a lot of flack if we said like if we if it was announced Sophia Coppola was doing a film about like. Uh, like inner city poverty. Do you know what I mean? She's she's yeah. talking about what she knows, and she's saying it sometimes sucks to be rich and famous. Oh yeah, yeah. Good, and that, good. that is kind of her thesis statement throughout her career. And I think this this film is kind yeah. of like the 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 flag planted in that of like it doesn't matter if you were a, a, a queen back in the day or you're kind of the daughter of a famous director. It fucking sucks to be famous she was what, 14 year old when she yeah. got engaged and she's 18 years old and she's meant to make decisions on a geopolitical state about England <laughs> America and, and Poland and she's just like I'm, I'm 18 and yeah. I'm way out of my depth that Partridge, can you make these decisions for me please <laughs> <laughs> There's that fantastic bit early on, isn't there, where um, she's about to be essentially sold into the French royal family and they take her into this tent and it's like a Formula One car going in for a pit stop. They have to strip anything Austrian off her, including her pet dog. 
and just replace it all with French stuff. And it's such a, a completely inhuman way of dealing with people. It, it's really hard not to feel for from that point onwards. Um, another way in which they're both sort of feel of a like is they both kind of hangout movies as well. They're very yeah. not hugely plot driven. They're both vibey and if you're being critical, slow. But I think that's also the intent. They are both intended as these hangout movies where you just experience these characters or the the mythology of these characters. It's just snapshots of Marie Antoinette's life, right? Like it's kind of it's yeah. fast and loose with like the passing of time. Like we've kind of got to play catch up. Like there's no there's no ti- there's no titles on screen. Like X amount of years have passed. We just kind of got to pick up on the fact of oh that, uh, yeah yeah, yeah that, <laughs> her daughter was a baby like a couple of scenes ago. I guess I guess she's like three or four now. Like and and like all, all of this stuff. And it's kind of you. I don't, I, yeah, I was watching it today with kind of. Marie Antoinette's Wikipedia page up as well, like kind of like going, oh yeah, this would have been this period of our life. Okay, okay, here we go. <laughs> like, but I, f- I think in 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 the way, like it would have been interesting. I think for as great as Scarlett Johansson is in uh, Lost in Translation, for it to have been Kissed and Dunce, just to have mm. this kind of like fame trilogy that they could have done mm. together. Like it, it, in that way, we were talking about Anya Taylor Joy and that kind of um like. Yeah, tease for the uh, upcoming episode is like she kind of Sophia Coppola kind of found her De Niro in the way of uh, Kiss and Dunce, and it's like if you if you kind of look at it in like a, in a way like Marie Antoinette is like Lux Lisbon if she had lived like do you know what I mean in, in in like a kind of weird way it's like that's what is fame as a child like well try going into adolescence into adulthood in fame like that's what this film is about and like it's interesting that this was going to be Sofia Coppola's second film but it was because she was finding like writing this so difficult so I think there was a she had bought the rights for another book before she got the second book which this is based off of and was finding it really difficult to like because it was very austere and very factual she's like Mm. I want somebody who's a bit more maybe sympathetic towards Marie Antoinette is that in that time she was like, I'm just going to write something else. And then Lost in Translation came out of that. And I think it would have been interesting to see that as this being the second film, because they very much like more so are like a real pair. Like it probably would have been a, a far lower budget film, I would have imagined, like without the kind of Oscar yeah. bump. But yeah, this, like, I don't know, like it, it, it's, it's hammering those themes, I think, from those first two movies, like bang, bang. Oh, yeah. me, for me, the one thing that I, I'll be upfront here, I really, really struggle with movies like this. I, I find had a similar thing when I first and watched it. Yeah. yeah. I think it's 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 films about royals. I just, I, I've enjoyed... Well, push watching. people with push hats. Yeah, exactly. Film set in a big house in the country. Uh, yeah, you have to be like Shakespeare to get me care, to care about that shit. And <laughs> okay. I will say the first time I watched this on release, I did not care for it at all. And part of the reason why I was excited about going back to it is I think the film itself would probably have dated better than my objections to it. And it absolutely has. I think it's an incredible film and you watch it now and you think oh if this didn't happen the favorite wouldn't have happened if this didn't happen you know bridgerton wouldn't have happened the great the personal history of david copperfield all those films that took the the kind of tedious heritage shell of these movies and really shaken them up i mean aside from the soundtrack one one thing that i think is really interesting and wonderful in this film is it has it is so focused on asking what it was like to be alive at that moment it is so focused on the things that haven't changed like animals and trees and sunlight and all of the impressionistic things that tend to get filtered out when it's like a merchant ivory heritage cinema adaptation and they have to get 500 pages of plot across in like two hours it's as we've said with the virgin suicides a very dreamy impressionistic look at Marie Antoinette's life and I think that's part of why it's so effective at making you understand 
what she felt like at that time. It, it takes you inside those sort of fleeting moments. Yeah, I am not a period, a period drama person, but I remember being so excited about this film coming out. I remember going to the cinema where I was working at the time to watch it. I bought myself some macarons because I was going to be fancy like Marie Antoinette, you know, mm -hmm. for the, the 4D experience <laughs> and I fell in love with the soundtrack. We played that soundtrack to death on the box office at our cinema because it was one, it was a film soundtrack so we could technically play it. And I had the poster up until this house where I'm living now. I had the poster up in a frame in the bedroom. I just, I love the the colour palette. And yeah, it's just, I like, I don't mind a film that is just sort of vibes and montages. And it still does manage to tell this like awful story of this, this woman trapped in, in this, trapped in a loveless relationship and she's surrounded by people who wouldn't necessarily be her friends. And there's this, there's, I think it's for me watching it back now as, as a mother, there's two, two short moments that really, or three that really speak to me. There's, there's one where there's Marie Antoinette and her daughter just like in the in the fields looking at the bees and things and you you know that that was improvised there is no way that a child that young was able to like learn lines or mm -hmm. anything it's just they got a, they got a camera on on Kirsten and this this kid and just filmed them and went perfect. and she's clearly French as well right like yeah. she just speaks yeah. in French and like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're not flying yeah. the kid over <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, but then there's there's the the scene where she's told that the daughter's been married off and she's like could we not wait until she started talking first you know it's like this nice sort of like look into the, the humor uh, humor of the character but then there's also this really tragic sequence where you see her having portraits done with the children and you see a portrait go up where it's her son her daughter and a baby and then that picture disappears and then an almost identical one comes back, which is now missing the baby. And, you know, just the, you know, what that is implying is, is horrific, but they didn't, they didn't feel the need to show that another period drama would have shown the, the still, but, you know, would have shown the, the baby dying and stuff. And I like that this, it gets that point across without it being all doom and gloom. I think that's where these two films kind of are related is, is those moments where like other films of the genre would have kind of lent into those moments. Like in the Virgin Suicides, there's the moment when Lux comes home after spending the night out and like Sophia Coppola just decides. And like with that moment, she decides it's the things that are unsaid. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I'm not, I, I don't need to show this. It's like people and it's kind of, and this film as well, again, probably, like, like like you you were like possibly around the time uh cat is like it appeals to young young girls young women do you know what i mean and it's like that thing of like well we don't need to spoon feed them we can just like or do we don't need to spoon feed just an audience in general of this is like i'm just gonna sh yeah like th this kind of uh impressionistic way of showing it it's probably more impactful right that kind of that changing of those paintings is kind of like I say it's almost like mu music video like in in a way, yeah. and it's like that, that 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 that's where I think she's really clever in the fact that she's she's going. I'll take this kind of stuffy, austere, what well, yeah, what could be like a period drama. Everyone like speaking, and she goes, "Do you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up in kind of MTV popcorn, pink glitter, and like package it that way, and then." To your point, Rob, about like feeling like I, I, I yeah, I'm, I'm a ma massive like anti-royalist like across the board, and uh, yeah, I feel yeah. like this film does a massive like feat by kind of like chipping away at my kind of thing of like this isn't about this isn't about a, a royal. This is kind of and, and I think some of it is kind of taking that sub subtextual thing about like looking at Sophia own Coppola's like Sophia Coppola's life and how she kind of relate it would relate to this character and kind of what she's trying to tell us through this story that is not just I want to tell the story of Marie Antoinette it's like no I want to tell the story of what it is like to be just a woman who is like forced into a life that maybe she didn't want to be in and is trying to kind of find her own freedom and like 
and it's and like... it still has that thing, doesn't it, from the Virgin Suicides about the vengefulness of gossip. It really shows the court of Versailles being like high school, except people actually die. Yeah. You know, it's... well, there's there, and, and this even more so. Like there are moments when we're hearing people like talk, and she makes mm. the choice to actually overlay the dialogue with the gossip instead. Like yeah. it's like. You kind of like for it takes you out for a second. You're like, is there something up up with the kind of like? Are they not matching the the mouths right here? And you're like, oh no no, that that's uh, that's aunt that's aunt Ginny and moaning Myrtle. That's yeah, that's that's that's, 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 that's the auntie and uh, moaning Myrtle from from Harry Potter, like having a moan up about her instead. Like, and the casting throughout this is we yeah we've got well, to talk about the casting. It's incredible. Has your Argento as Madame de Barry, like. Yeah, of course it fucking is like of course it's gotta be of course she's got she's kind of like she's got resting bitch face she kind of like <laughs> i don't th I, th I think time has like probably uh helped the fact that to to, to, to portray her as a villain as well like, <laughs> like but yeah like speaking of time you've got jamie dornan you've got tom hardy all captured when they were just i think 10 years old in this film <laughs> Jason, I've got I've I've got to mention this because I, I will I will I will go to I will go I will not be able to sleep tonight if I don't. I have to tip my hat to Jason Schwartzman for the fact he has an elephant's trunk rub against his face and just goes with it. <laughs> <laughs> He's having that discussion with I think it's Danny Houston, like by the by the menagerie, and just takes a, takes an elephant's trunk to the face and goes, you know what? Yeah, let's just roll with the scene. And like, what what a champ. Yeah, and you've got Rose Byrne as well as the as the the, the gossip of was the the fun loving hedonistic friend to a to a degree. Um Marianne yeah, Faithful. Rip yeah. Tarn in there. Yeah. 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 Perfect king of France for that era. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jason Schwartzman playing like a kind of like I don't think the thing as well, this this film is happy to go into kind of speculation and rumour as well. The fact that like I think for a long time there was there was speculation that Louis the Sixteenth might have been gay. Like that was the reason why he couldn't consummate their marriage, which I think took like seven years. Or something yeah. like that. <laughs> oh, you've just got another hunting trip to go on, love. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but I like the fact it's sort of like it's not at least in the film we see her 18th birthday, and then it's not too long after that that it's consummated. Because as we mentioned, you know, she was like 14 or 15 when she was sold. Yeah. And I, you know, I like the fact that there was some degree of consent. Like he was waiting for her to get to. He didn't like it. Though, though obviously there is the potential. Maybe he was a homosexual, but also maybe he just didn't want to sleep with a child. Yeah, you know? well, he, he was fifteen as he was fifteen when they got married as well. So, yeah, but, even, but even so, yeah. it's you know, it's you know, it's a, it's a it's a daunting yes. thing at, at that age. You know, want to wait until they are both consenting adults instead of children forced into it. Because it's that whole the whole sequences in the bedroom, like on the marriage night, where you know, the whole court goes to watch them get into bed together, and then each morning there's all those women taking turns to like clothe her and stuff. It's just one big farce isn't it and i do think that as much as this is a film about royals sophia is poking fun at all of this like pomp and circumstance and, and ritual yeah and she's poking fun at the fact of like what it is to be like an actor as well do you know what I mean like that that kind of thing of like like watching the the making of documentary that's like accompanying this it's like you kind of get a glimpse of that of like there's that shot where marie antoinette delivers the line like let them eat cake and you like there's a there's a kind of prolonged shot and it's kind of like ironic in the fact of it's it's Kirsten Dunst in the bathtub and somebody's there and the, the shot lasts like maybe like two three minutes of them like fixing her hair and stuff like that and it's like mm. this is literally what the film is kind of poking fun at like all of this kind of like you cannot do anything yourself you have to have someone there obviously you've got somebody like checking continuity and stuff like that touching up your makeup and stuff like that and it's like and, and this is like, irony throughout it all. <laughs> and speaking of comes. continuity, sorry, speaking of continuity, what do we think about the converse? <gasps> I you're love a, the converse. You're a timeless shoe. What can, what can <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a great moment. I've seen some photos from behind the scenes where um 
Jason Schwartzman's checking something on an Apple Mac, and I thought, I wish you'd left that in the final cut, actually. That's as good as the Converse. I think that is like the uh, cover for the making of documentary <laughs> is yeah him and him and kirsten dunce and and on the uh, on the dvd i know at least and probably on the blu-ray as well is uh jason schwartzman does a mtv cribs as nice. Louis for, for, the, for, 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 for the for the for the yeah for their castle <laughs> this is amazing yeah excellent double bill though honestly i think uh for me this was kind of a discovery I didn't really perfect clarity. I didn't really think a lot of her because mm. I, I don't really know why. It's just one of those things. You sort of colour an opinion and you keep that opinion and you can't remember why you had it in the first place. I think I remember. Yeah, I distinctly remember. I loved the Virgin Suicides when it came out. I liked Lost in Translation, and when I heard her next film was going to be about the life of Marie Antoinette, I thought getting a bit self parodic with the poor little rich girl theme now, aren't we? But <laughs> Once you broke out of that and you realise that that's just her theme, you know, she's a, an author, she has themes, it's yeah. really easy to appreciate these films, and I do think they are, I now think they are both wonderful. Yes, indeed. I do think that Dross and Translation's dated a little bit with mm. uh, its treatment of accents in Japan. It's a little bit... It's got moved on a bit shops. past that. Yeah. yeah. But otherwise... Um, so that leads us to the last question of... Uh, the day. What are our feelings on her as a filmmaker? And her film output is kind of erratic at this point. If she were to retire today, hypothetical, has she left behind a good body of work? Well, she's very much not retired because she's got a film out this year. I she's didn't know that bit. <laughs> to, 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 to continue her theme of, her, of what it is to be a celebrity, she has a film called Priscilla, all about Priscilla Presley. So very much kind of dipping back into the um, biography pool as well. Um, which I'm, Child I'm, bride pool. Yeah, I'm waiting yeah. on like tender hooks for, for, that, for that film because I think... I don't know. I've, Before that, I it love... was The Beguiled, wasn't it? And that was a good show. 2017, yeah. No, no, she did no. the film uh, the On the Rocks, yeah, with Bill Murray and Rashida Jones, but that came out on Apple Plus, so no, no. one knows if it exists. Yeah, it a, it it's a lockdown film, yeah, it's kind of came <laughs> yeah. out of the doldrums of lockdown, yeah. But I think with, like, uh, as her body of work, I like the fact that she is kind of like, she's like, she almost like future-proofed herself in the fact of, like, as I said earlier, if she if she had like made some films about like inner city like living and stuff like that, or she'd kind of made like a, a a race relations like film or something like that, people would be looking back on them even more so than like Lost in Translation being like, well, weren't a good call there. Whereas she has gone, this is what I know. I know what it is like. I know what celebrity is. I know I know I know the kind of multifaceted like elements of it. I'm just gonna do films about that and then she's yeah. just she's just stuck to that and it's kind of it's a real testament to the fact that like you can do a whole career and kind of like i don't know, almost milk the same udder as it <laughs> for, for want of a better phrase well, what a horrible euphemism <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> terrible euphemism. <laughs> yeah I, I i couldn't think of the actual one yeah but she's 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 she's, she's, she's getting water from the same well but has managed to just kind of like bottle it up in different ways like i like you look at this compared to somewhere and it's like they're they're totally di they're, they're totally different film like so, somewhere i think for me is like my kind of my favorite sofia coppola film just because as I, because i'm entrenched in the kind of family as a whole and stuff like that and there's like big things in that of uh some of it is probably true to what it was like to be francis ford coppola's daughter and i think like the character of johnny demarco in that film it's like I think she looked to another branch of her family tree and went, I've got an, I've got a cousin who's kind of like a bit of a washed up like action star. Who's kind of like ticking, ticking away and might've lived in the Chateau Mamont in Nicholas Cage. And it's like, it's kind of like that, that, that one feels like the most autobiographical. So that's like, that, that's really fascinating. But yeah, I think, I think if she were, if, if, if Priscilla were not to come out, I think she's kind of, she's really planted her flag of like being, a fantastic director i just think like she kind of 
springboarded off of the name and kind of right made a name for herself like and hey we got another generation coming i'm not sure if any of you saw the the tiktok that her daughter made yeah. uh, <laughs> that's the directing talent we got coming next let, let bring it on let's bring on let's bring on coppola generation free baby yeah i mean for me as somebody that studied media production at, at uni and wanted to make films there weren't many female directors that were getting into mainstream cinemas so she was somebody that i followed lost in translation came out when i was at uni and so i sort of followed her career from then on for that reason i never wanted to be a director i was always about producing gail and heard was is my icon um you know but her body of work is so interesting and i guess i myself am drawn to to fame which is perhaps why i'm so drawn to her work somewhere i agree is absolutely fantastic but the bling ring as well i mean i was i was the audience for the hills and it was the stars of the hills that were some of the people whose houses that that group robbed so i always have a lot of time for her for her work and i think that yeah if she was to stop working now that it would be a very admirable catalog that as petra said was it all deals with fame from different from different points of view mm. different time periods and yeah the the fans the queens the 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 teens down the street yeah i think i think it's a nice solid batch of work the only one for me that doesn't quite work is the beguiled and i guess that's as we touched on earlier it's maybe not so much to do with that fame angle so yeah i'm also very keen to see what she does with priscilla because the fact that priscilla was like basically a child when elvis met her is glossed over quite heavily in the <laughs> uh, elvis biopic as good as austin butler is that's kind of just swept under the carpet so i'm quite intrigued to see uh, yeah. a different version of that romance and I think yeah. Priscilla's got her blessing on it as well. So uh, uh, hopefully that means like, do you know what I mean? Like the, the truth is being told. We can have the counterpoint mm -hmm. to Elvis. At that era though, when she was prominent, much more prominent, I think she was pretty much the only female director in the mainstream. I can't think of any of the yeah. peers. Who had. Catherine Bigelow, I guess, would have been... been, been she Aaron. was in, in her dry period when yeah. the cult Bullet was coming up though, wasn't she? It yeah. Would have been, what is it? Danger uh, what's the something days? Strange days? Yeah, I Strange Days strange was days. yeah, sort of like the late nineties, wasn't it? And then Yeah. Uh, Zero Dark Thirty was sort of early two thousands, early mid two thousands. So yeah, oh, there was isn't it? Like yeah, oh my god, um, is it that? Oh my god, her, I'm old. It was like yesterday. Her, her <laughs> that was it. Twenty twenty nine, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, but yeah, she was, like I say, when I was at uni, she was one of the only female directors out there. And I'm just so happy that the landscape has now changed and that there'll be other people who will be able to see themselves, not just in terms of, of male and female, but in, in people of colour and gender orientation. There is somebody there to to tell these stories for them. Hmm. There, Graham. Well, it's interesting for me thinking about Sofia Coppola as as like a whole career because in the end, it's one of those directors where she was right and I was wrong. And I think a lot of things that I took against with something like Marie Antoinette, the sort of the, the sort, as I say, the poor little rich girl vibe of it is something that I've completely misinterpreted, and a lot of the things that appeared frivolous or misguided about it at the time and now things that appear incredibly crazy and I mean the fact that the last act of this is a bunch of people talking about austerity economics has, uh, has aged particularly well I think but so I, I think having turned around completely on that I'm really interested to see I think the only one of the later films I actually bothered with was The Beguiled and I agree that that doesn't entirely work, although maybe that's because I'm a huge fan of the Don Siegel version and that always kind of lives in my head with it. Um, but I would love to get back to somewhere. I would love to go and see the bling ring and, and see um, yeah. the things from the perspective of like realising that this is not somebody who who has sort of who has gone off the boil. This is someone who is getting deeper and deeper into a set of incredibly consistent thematic and stylistic motifs and is 
now I think more influential than she ever was when she was the young, trendy new thing. Nowadays, you, you can see so many films and TV shows and things. Not least the fucking TV show version of Marie Antoinette, which is absolutely spraining its every marketing muscle to say, <laughs> hey, remember that Kirsten Dunst movie? But yeah, you know, I, I, I'll take the L on this. She won in the long term. She was right. I'm, I'm really happy when you get the chance to reassess something like that and think, oh, this. There's actually tons more to this than I ever thought. Indeed, indeed. That's a great sentiment to end on, really. Yeah, it's, for me too, she's kind of a great discovery. Yeah. Because I'm tired of with the, the sort of zeitgeisty vibe of Lost in Translation, and mm. that's just not fair when so much has happened since and, and before that. But it is what it is. Learned yeah. me mistake, moved on. And I'll, like yourself, Graham, I'll be checking out some of her other stuff because uh, the two of you, uh, Petros and Kat, have been very evangelical about the other stuff, so it seems like it's worth <laughs> a check. Suasive. Yeah. Okay, so that wraps us up for this week's episode. Um, Kat, where can we find yourself online? Well, that's the question these days, isn't it? Um, I am at Gizmo Shikari on Twitter because I can't learn new things and um, Instagram and Letterbox. I am trying out Blue Sky. I am cathughes.bsky.social on there. And I also have my own fledgling podcast with my four-year-old daughter called Movies with Mummy, which it's is great. On, uh, thank you. Apple and Spotify. It's just chaos. It's five minutes of me <laughs> trying to get her to talk about something we've watched recently <laughs> that up until we hit record, she's really, really keen to do. And then we hit record and the wheels come off and we have been joined by like every cuddly toy that she's got um, as special <laughs> guests. Um <laughs> And just a plug for something uh, that I've done recently. If you purchase the snazzy special edition of uh, Second Sight, It Follows, you will find an essay written by me, which, uh, yeah, that's very exciting to be able to contribute to a Second Sight release. Mm. Wonderful releases that they're doing and being part of that yeah. must, be, must be great, yeah. Very exciting. Um, Graham? I'm on Letterboxd. Uh, just search for Graham Williamson. I'm on Instagram at Graham W Film. Uh, you can read my, I'm sort of a, a mostly regular columnist in Byline Times. Sometimes I miss a month. Uh, <laughs> but I, I do something for the print edition of Byline Times most months. Uh, and, of course, I am the host and creator of Pop Screen, the geek show podcast that covers movies starring by or about pop stars. Uh, and I also write for the geek show, of course. Yeah. I never thought you'd cross 100 episodes, but apparently that's a rich vein of cinema. Pop stars and movies. <laughs> <laughs> you never knew. <laughs> and we celebrate it by doing Xanadu. <laughs> what an occasion <laughs> and uh, Petros uh, you can find yeah Caged in Coppola Connections or just anything Coppola related or Nicolas Cage related uh, on all your podcast platforms uh, you can find me like on the socials it's at Caged in Pod on basically everything even on Blue Sky just type in Caged in Pod and you'll, I'm sure you'll find me uh, I also as I mentioned in the podcast do a Willem Dafoe uh, based podcast called Getting Defoe You, which is on all the socials at Defoe You Pod. And yeah, we're seasonal based. So we have an excellent first season that's kind of looking at uh, a wide variety of stuff. Uh, I think our kind of standout film for us in the, the first season has been To Live and Die in LA, which is um, a bittersweet at the moment, seeing as yes. the recent passing of William Friedkin. Um, uh, yeah, but. Yeah, come check out all of that stuff because it, it's a lot of fun. Like, in regards to the Coppola family, like, I've managed to interview a lot of people who've worked on the films and uh, been involved with the Coppolas in some weird and wonderful ways. Uh, find out how Sky Elobar, the uh, actor from The Greasy Strangler, uh, has a connection to the Coppola family on one podcast, and that is uh, Cage Den. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, just, just as said follow on the socials uh check out the podcast and yeah just if, if we plug in uh for releases that we've been involved in uh if there's still copies out there i imagine there are 
get a copy of Red Rock West, the John Dahl film from 1993, uh, because I have a video essay on that release, which uh, um, Signal One put out, and I'm kind of like, still to this day, even though it's been like a year since the release of that, I kind of, I don't kick myself that I'm, pinch myself that I'm not dreaming in a way, because it's like, oh, I've dedicated my life to talk about Nicolas Cage and his entire family, and now I'm kind of a part of the ephemera of that in being, uh, yeah, being on that release. So yeah, get that. It's limited edition. Get, get a copy. I think it's on sale on Amazon or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, keep up the date with everything in the podcast. Um, uncut Robcast across most social media, not Blue Sky B or whatever it's called. It's that's something else, isn't it? Blue Sky. It's Blue Sky. Um, <laughs> but Fred's Instagram, Twitter, link, um, letterbox to find me there. And in the next episode, we'll be talking about uh, Samara Weaving in the first month of Actors Uncut. So we're passing on over to that. Yeah.